Okay. <coughs> Let me go on. Let me continue my uh, monologue and uh, blabbering. Uh, okay, this time let me talk. Let me talk a little bit about the concept of growing up. Uh, I was talking about it a little bit uh, in my uh, in my last video, and uh, I've I've always been uh, preoccupied with <laughs> with the concept concept of uh, growing up all my life, uh, together with uh, all other numerous life issues. Okay, what what is the the concept of what what does Growing up mean. Growing up, as I was saying in my previous video, uh, I believe that uh, gr when you when you grow up, or when, when somebody when when you grow up, you you have you should have had some experience. Of having been accepted by somebody else, Pre uh, preferably by a lot of people, a lot of people, especially including your parents. Uh, when you are more or less similar to your parents, when you when you think when you think that uh, there are some similarities between your your personality and your parents or at least one of them that parent or those parents uh, of course uh, they find it very easy to love you because when you when you have a lot of similarities, uh, when you have, when you have something in common, of course it's easy for you to to love each other, right? For example, um, not for example. Um, yes. Anyway, uh, people love each other precisely because they have something in common. Of course, they do have, they do uh, find some differences, and those differences may may turn into the cause of uh, a clash um, personal conflicts and uh, confrontations and uh, sometimes battles quarreling and uh, sometimes into disaster maybe but uh, those disasters or personal confrontations or conflicts uh, will will end up being uh, comparatively minor minor ones when you believe that what is common between your parent or a parents and you uh, when you believe that you, you have something in a way even though not much, if you have something in common between your parents and parents, or you, uh, at least one of you, one of them, and you, then you, it's rather easy. It's rather comparatively easy for you, for you and for your parents to to love to love each other. And uh, in in this uh, in the process of this mutual loving, it is it naturally naturally. Uh, uh, naturally, um, grow the the, uh, the process of growing up occurs. So you you find it e relatively easy to to, uh, to to grow up because l growing up means first being accepted the way you are, more or less anyway. And even if you even if your parent or parents are uh, diametrically different from you, then uh, very often that kind of person, yeah, very very often you uh, go out, go outside, uh, you you seek some soulmate or something or or a friend, 
a, a close friend or a mentor outside, outside of, of your home. And you, so uh, having given up on the idea of uh, uh, finding a mentor or, or a friend uh, in your parents, you can go out and uh, seek some companion. And, uh, and if you, uh, if you, ha if you can find something in common with anybody in society, uh, it's la uh, you are lucky. Perhaps you find a close friend uh, of the same sex or of the opposite sex, or a, or a teacher, or a friend, or a, anybody, or a relative, or a, or a brother or a sister. And uh, you, you and that person uh, find love or friendship between 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 the two of you, and uh, you feel accepted, and you accept that person, and uh, this mutual acceptance and love and friendship uh, makes you allows you to grow up, because because growing up. In order, in order for you to grow up, you have to be first accepted the way you are, more or less anyway. Maybe not a hundred percent, but uh, at least a half of your personality, a half of a half of you, must be accepted by somebody else, at least one person, if you want to grow up. But what if? Yes, I mean. Most people, maybe 99.9% or maybe more than 90%, I don't, I'm not sure, at least 70% anyway, most probably more than 90% or perhaps 99.9% .9 of people in society are that way. That, that, that means 99, uh, most people, 99.9% .9 of people uh, have has, have, have, uh, should have found someone, at least one, someone, uh, at least one person with whom they could or can feel comfortable. Maybe Maybe one of one of their parents, if not one of their siblings, if not one of their relatives, if not uh, one of the uh, one of someone, one of the world. Anyway, maybe a teacher or maybe a, a distant friend or something. So most people are lucky enough to have found someone in society, either in the family or in, in the outside world, with whom he, they can or could f feel accepted, more or less, at least a half of you, a half of them. But what if you are a, you are a member of an absolute minority, such as such as a such as a such as a group of uh, anti-natalists or um, anyway suppose you are suppose you are a minority person suppose you are you belong to this uh, minority which accounts for uh, 0.1% of the world w only one out of every thousand people is similar to you. If so, then what happens? You look and look. You look. You look and look in the in the family, and uh, you find nobody, nobody remotely similar to you. Everybody in the family is uh, is uh, diamet diametrically different from you. So you. Early in, life, in, in your life, early in your childhood, or even when you were a, an infant, maybe when you, even when you were a baby, you, uh, you, you cease 
you you have you must have given up on the idea of uh, ever finding a mentor or a friend or a, anybody in favor of you in the, among the family members. Then you naturally seek some solace outside, uh, outside the family. Then what happens? You find nobody else, nobody. Because this, this one person out of every 1,000 people uh, never shows up, almost never anyway. Because those people too, have always, throughout their lives, uh, have always given up on the idea of finding any anybody remotely similar to them. So they, uh, perhaps they, uh, they have uh, crawled into their shells a long, long time ago, decades ago, maybe, just like I, <coughs> just like me. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so it's see, it's really hard for you <coughs> as a minority person. It's really hard for you to find anybody remotely similar to you in society because, uh, <coughs> however hard you look, you find it, you find no such person. You find no su such person. Uh, in your um, range of, uh, in your field of view, anyway, because those, those people, those minority people who might be uh, somewhat similar to you uh, are hiding somewhere, maybe <coughs> behind their own doors. Maybe they stay, maybe stay, maybe they stay, uh, all their lives in their own rooms and never come out into society. <coughs> or maybe uh, many of them, they may, many of them may have uh, killed killed themselves, <coughs> or gone insane and uh, sent to asylums. I mean, mental asylums, uh, madhouses. Uh, mental institutions, yes. Or maybe uh, so, some of them may have, uh, a few of them may have uh, <coughs> entered the world of art or a academic uh, academic learning, and uh, they may have become famous uh, writing writing books on philosophy or literature or something. Or maybe they, they may have become singers, famous singers or something. But those people are so remote from you. Uh, they, they, are, they are so high, highly intelligent uh, and famous or artistically talented and they, they, you can't ever, you can't ever uh, get to have, to, to be friends with them anyway. <coughs> so. What do pe these people, what do these uh, minority people who have found no soulmate in anywhere, uh, what can these people do? They can do nothing. So, uh, so all their lives, all their li lives, uh, typ typically they they, they typically find no such soulmate, soulmates anywhere. Not in their family, not di not in the outside world either. So, what happens? They never grow up because growing up, in order for you to grow up, grow up. As I said before, in order for you to grow up, you have to be first. First, you have to be accepted by someone, at least one person, the way you are. Perhaps not 100%, but at least 50%, you have to be accept, accepted the way you are. When somebody, when 
when at least one member of society says to you in person, yes, you are what you are. And I am, I think I, I think I know where you're coming from. And I'll be always, I'll always be there for you when you are depressed or anything. Uh, I think I know, I think I, I think I uh, have experienced something like that, something like uh, uh, what you have been describing. And uh, I think perhaps 50% 50, 50 of me is similar to, to, to you. Although there are maybe a lot of other a lot of differences between you and me, but uh, basically at least fifty percent of you I understand. If that happens, then only after that can you grow up. But as far as I am concerned, no, I have never found all my life. I have never found any such person. At least not in real life, anyway. Perhaps on the internet, I'm in the, on the internet. I may have found some people like that, but unfortunately, through the internet, I can't. I can't uh, talk talk so intensely with anybody because through the internet, uh, human relationships or human interaction, if there is any, on the internet, through the internet, is far less dense, far less dense than human, than the, than the human interaction and the relationships in real life. In real life, you, you can, you can, uh, you can, I mean, as a, as children, they, you can play with each other, playing, playing, uh, uh, playing baseball or uh, going to going to stores and eating together and uh, sometimes quarreling or fighting, fighting and uh, reading together, studying together, uh, going to school together, and uh, if. If you are in love with each other, maybe having sex, having sex or hugging each other, looking at each other, looking into you, uh, each other's eyes, hearing each other's voices, and everything. So, uh, human relationships, human interaction in real life is much more intense, much more dense, much more. How do you see it? Much more real than the human interaction, if there is any, through the internet. So, th through the internet, yes, you you may. Uh, uh, there is a far. Uh, there, there must be. I know there must be a, a far higher possibility of finding someone a bit similar to you, even if you were a member of the minority, uh, because the internet is connected to the whole world. But in real life, it is rather hard for me to to meet anybody in. In Alaska, in the Hawaii, in, Haw in in Hawaii, or in 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 South Africa, or or on the Antarctica, <coughs> uh, so uh, people, the people I have ever been in uh, slightly in contact with, have been limited to. Only a small range of people in risk in this limited area in a limited uh, range of areas anyway. And besides, uh, many reclusives, most reclusives. I mean, 
when you are a when you are a member of the minority, you tend to be a reclu recluse. And uh, if you if you want to find someone, so a soulmate, uh, more or less like you, uh, that that other person must be a recluse. And uh, those recluse, uh, those recluses, those recluded people, those uh, those include those uh, what introspective and. Uh, tender-hearted people tend to be tend to tend to have crawled into their shells so uh, uh, in real life they they usually never show up so they talk only on the uh, through the internet so that's why those people tend to those t people tend to be uh, tend to be uh, outgoing through the internet. So that's why we, my kind of people, peop, uh, tend to seem to tend to uh, uh, find some people who seem to be somewhat similar to me. But as I said before, through the internet, however hard I try, I can't get really in touch with them. Uh, I can't see their faces. Some people do uh, show their faces on 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 YouTube, maybe, but but I, but most of them never show their faces, even when they are when they uh, when they are uploading their videos, and uh, most of them. Maybe more than ninety-nine point nine percent of those recluses uh, never want to show their faces. Never want to uh, let let other people uh, hear their voices either. And they are they are not. And most of them are not eloquent enough. I mean, uh, the, most of them are. Um, how do you say it? They, they don't write too much. They, uh, and when they are, uh, when they don't, when they don't talk much, it's really hard for you to 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 get to know to get to know them well. So. Uh, So uh, either in real life or or through the internet, such people, such minority people, can't ever. Maybe not can't ever, but uh, very seldom such minority people very seldom find a soulmate e either in real life or through the inter through the internet. Anyway, I uh, as far as far as I am concerned, I have all 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 my life throughout these sixty three years, I have never found any soulmate or real any. I have never found any real soulmate or anybody I can really feel comfortable with. So I have given up. All on that, on the idea of ever finding any such person, I do find. I do, uh, uh, as a human, all too human. I have. I, when I was younger, I ha used to have so-called friends. A uh, ten, twenty, maybe, including acquaint uh, acquaintances with with whom I could uh, greet uh, maybe 30 or 40. But uh, as, as the years went by, I, uh, uh, people, people got, uh, peop uh, people uh, lost touch with each other. Uh, as I look back, 
on on all that. Mm, perhaps uh, so-called friends were not really friends at all in the first place. And uh, I have one. Uh, I have only one friend uh, remaining loyal to me, and I I remain loyal to him. We know each other. We have known each other for the past of forty-three years. Hmm? No, I don't know. Uh, since the age of fourteen, I have known him since the age of fourteen. We we are of the same age, and uh, we trust each other in the sense that we never, almost never, criticize each other. We try. We anyway we try to accept each other, despite all the differences we may have between between us. He's actually he's diametrically different from me, and I know that he never understands me. Uh, but he never judge, judges me. And besides, we never philosophize on. We almost never philosophize on life. He is not the kind of. He's a rather pra practically minded, and he never philosophizes on life. He ne he has never uh, he has never um, really thought seriously, uh, or he. I don't think he has ever wondered seriously uh, what he really is or anything. <coughs> he, he may have had some hardships in, in his life, but not, but uh, those hardships, even those hardships, I don't think that those hardships are uh, that traumatic. Uh, at least not in comparison with mine. As for me, I have, I have been traumatized. Uh, I have, I, th I think I have uh, undergone uh, a lot, numerous uh, traumas, uh, uh, which were, which were devastating to me, which were, which al almost destroyed me and uh, which almost uh, drove me insane. There was a time. Uh, there was a time I almost went insane, uh, and I and I had a very narrow, narrow escape. Anyway, uh, so uh, there are a lot of differences between between us, but he never judges me. I I almost never judge him. So so we. So we, uh, so we uh, keep in touch, and perhaps uh, we will keep in touch uh, until until uh, death do us part. But uh, but I don't think we will really. I don't think there will come a time when uh, we really understand each other at least not not he me. he is not the kind of person who understands me he, so uh, I'm not sure whether he uh, he is the kind of person I can call a friend he is of course a very good acquaintance of mine but I don't know if I can call him my best friend so what is a best friend? I have never, I don't think I have ever had a, f a best friend or a close friend. Uh, of course I have had, as a human, all too human, when I was younger I had a lot of so-called friends. I played, I mean, I, uh, I uh, had had a lot of uh, uh, good time with. We drank together, we uh, laughed together, we uh, studied together, we spoke English together. 
Okay? Even though they are, they are all Japanese. Uh, we talked about everything. At least everything that is not too phil uh, philosophical, because those other people were never the, the kinds of people who philosophize over life. Uh, they were so so all of them were di diametrically different from me anyway. And as the years went by, uh, as the years went by, I uh, got far far from them. They we we went separate ways. And they had they have had kids. I didn't. I never did. Ah, by the way, mm, eh, when I think of, uh, I mean, when I think of my life, I mean, uh, about uh, 11, 11 months ago, I uh, rediscovered Karen Carpenter, and uh, I heard, I listened to, I listened to all, all her songs, and. Examined, examined every word of all of her songs, about 170 songs, and uh, I, uh, I also read and watched a lot of. Uh, I mean, I read uh, her biographies, and I, I watched all, uh, all her documentaries, and all, and all the news on her. At least all the news that I that I had lays uh, uh, lays. Hmm? At least I I read all the news the news articles that on her that I had, had I laid I uh, I laid my hands on, and uh, I read all all the materials, all the materials on, on Karen Carpenter, and I, I have learned that, uh, I have learned, and I think that uh, I find in her some of me, I find some of me, I think I, I understand at least a half of, a half of her. Perhaps she was uh, nobody. Uh, uh, people say that uh, nobody knows. Nobody actually knows what she was really thinking or feeling, uh, because nobody can get into that, get into her head. And besides, she was secretive. I mean, she she was really always outspoken, and uh, uh, she was giving all all of her. Is she seemed. She seemed to be giving all of her to the world and to her close friends too. And uh, she had a lot of friends, numerous friends. And uh, despite her uh, frantically uh, busy life, she managed to keep in touch with numerous friends. And uh, she gave all that, all that joy to to the world and to to her friends too, and uh, all those friends and uh, all those fans uh, have really fantastic memories of her. But still, people say that Karen Carpenter was the part, kind of person who never showed. the deepest recesses of her psychology to anyone, anyway. He, she never showed herself. She always had something hidden deep at their, deep at her, uh, at her existence, existence. So we never know, nobody knows what she, what she was really thinking, how she was really feeling behind that mask, that front. A uh, friend of Franklin Leffler and uh, 
Ichi, their friend called uh, Ichi, nicknamed the French Ichi. These uh, two friends, and also Curticello and so on, those friends were uh, were her close friends, and especially a friend of Franklin Nefla was her by far her uh, closest friend and mentor. People say that, but even that close closest friends, even those closest friends, never seem to know uh, what Karen Carpenter was actually thinking deep at, the, at her heart. So what would, uh, so, uh, of course, I, of course, uh, as a person, not even a native speaker, and uh, who, uh, who have never, uh, who has never been to the United States, who has never actually met her in person, of course, I can't ever know what she was really thinking, how she was really thinking. But judging from all these materials, all that information about her, I think I know at least some of her, some of her, if not all of her. I think I understand some of her. And uh, she, uh, just a minute, what was I trying to say? What was I? What did I wanted to say? Uh, excuse me. Mm. Uh, she. I think she never thought that uh, it was ever possible for anybody to understand anybody else. I think she believed that uh, she was an enigma to herself, maybe. Or maybe she was, I don't think she was a philosophical type. Uh, she, she was really artistically talented and she was really good. She was really highly talented in uh, expressing herself as far as, as, far as her uh, positive aspects are concerned. She was very good in in expressing her joys and uh, expressing her, at least expressing her uh, superficial sadness, uh, superficial superficial aspects of her sadness are concerned. For example, uh, in, in her songs, uh, even though those songs were not never written by herself, but uh, those were written by some people who knew knew her very well, and uh, especially John Bettis, the, the lyricist, lyricist, who is reputed to be uh, the third uh, carpenter. This lyricist, uh, John Bettis, knew, knew Karen Carpenter very well. Uh, they were very good friends, and they talked to each other very, uh, very often. And uh, uh, he he thought he thought uh, that uh, he had very much in common uh, with with her. Uh, he he uh, at, uh, especially the sad side of their psychology. And so uh, this lyricist uh, John Bettis knew how in what way Karen was sad. And uh, so uh, he, uh, John Bettis, he he wrote many poems, many or uh, many uh, many lyrics for her uh, about what he thought uh, Karen was thinking or feeling. And uh, he did a marvelous job. And uh, uh, gladly, uh, gladly, uh, Karen Carpenter. Uh, uh, sang those songs written by uh, John Bettis, which, which seemed to depict her real feelings and uh, thoughts. But still, though even those, 
even those aspects of sadness and everything, are only superficial, I guess. I'm not blaming uh, the lyricist or Karen Carpet or anybody. It is almost impossible, I think, I believe that it is almost impossible for any song, for any uh, short song to depict all of anybody's existence. Excuse me. How can any three minute song depict anybody's whole the whole of anybody's existence or feelings or the system of the entire system of thoughts and feelings that anybody has. It is impossible. Of course, maybe maybe a song, even though it is very short, with with its melody, with its beautiful melody and everything. A work of art, even though it is very short and very very small in scale, it may depict something that people, the audience, can feel instinctively what whatever the artist seems to be trying to get through to the audience. Intuitively the audience can understand what the artist is saying, what the artist may have been undergoing all through her life, maybe. But still, uh, even that is, I must say, even that must be superficial. Uh, deep at her heart, deep at, at, deep beyond her subconscious, maybe, Karen Carpenter must have been feeling or thinking something else. And that something else I want to understand. I am desperate to, uh, I desperately want to understand. And uh, I imagine that I have, even in that at the deepest recesses of her Karen Carpenter, I think I find, I think I may find something in common with her. So, uh, Perhaps he, she had, he, perhaps she had given up, given up on ever finding. Ah, he, uh, she had given up. Uh, perhaps she had given up on on the idea of ever finding anybody, any soulmate, any love. Perhaps she had found it impossible, uh, impossible to find anybody who may understand her. At least more than a half, more than a half of her. Uh, but uh, but at least until uh, the age of thirty or something, until she failed in her, in her uh, marriage. In her, in her love and marriage, uh, she had always, she seemed to have always loved Disneyland and this dream world. She was the, she was surrounded all the time. Uh, her bedroom was, her bedroom was full of Disneyland articles, uh, Mickey Mouse, Mickey Mouse toys and everything. So her bed was surrounded by numerous, numerous toy animals, Mickey Mouse, Mickey Mouse, and other piglets and everything. And she loved the new Disneyland. She uh, when she was when she was singing, when she was singing in 
und uh, in Disneyland uh, we we can watch watch videos of her uh, on that location and uh, she's she seems very happy and i think she was really 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 happy because uh, because she, re she she all her life she really loved disneyland and uh, that kind of person uh, yes uh, when i think of uh, when i think of karen carpenter's loving disneyland i remember um, who uh, who michael jackson Michael Jackson was another another person who 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 loved who dearly loved the world of children. She and he, um, Michael Jackson, established uh, built his his own dreamland uh, in where Hollywood? No, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, uh, he built the large estate uh, like a castle somewhere uh, in a in a distant land in uh, far away, far away from uh, the large cities and uh, in on this large huge estate there was there were a lot of trees and there was a huge huge forest and uh, uh, a lot of gardens, a lot of beautiful, uh, dreamlike gardens, and a large castle-like house, and uh, uh, a lot of toys for children, a lot of uh, a lot of can, a lot of candy for children. And uh, he invited when he was when he was a, a, alive. He he invited a lot of children from all over the world, together with their parents. To his castle, to his uh, to his dreamland. I, I don't remember what what that place is called, but anyway, uh, let me call it a dreamland, uh, his dreamland. And uh, he, why 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 was he obsessed that obsessive about about this dreamland or the the, the land of children? Why? Because, uh, as a family of this uh, group, as a f as a family of singers, who have who had always been busy, always been busy singing on the stage, he had he had always been busy singing on the stage ever since he was six. So. At the age of six, he had he had stopped. Uh, he had stopped uh, being a normal child. He had never had a normal childhood. He was b always busy as a public figure. He was always so everybody was always watching him. Ever since he was six. So he never had any privacy. So he, he, all his life, he had always craved childlike things. So people say that he remained, he remained a child. He never grew up. That's what people say. And uh, this aspect of never growing up may have some beautiful aspects and negative aspects as well in the way uh, in the sense that he because of his childlike childlike Peter Pan like yes Peter Pan Peter Pan who the figure who never grew up Michael Jackson's Identity and not me. Michael Jackson's ideal was Peter Pan. So, in his castle, in his dreamland, uh, in his dreamland uh, estate, the, there were, there was a room full of Peter Pan uh, articles, and uh, there were there was a Peter Pan doll, huge Peter Pan doll, doll uh, flying in the air in his room, in, in one of his numerous rooms, 
uh, together with the t uh, Tinkerbell uh, character and all the other numerous uh, Peter Brown articles. And so that particular room was devoted to the world of Peter, Pan's, uh, Peter Pan. And uh, he really loved it. And uh, his fan, his fans were children. Uh, children fans really loved that room too. So uh, children uh, adored, uh, absolutely adored uh, uh, Michael Jackson and, and vice versa. So uh, uh, he never grew up. He was always a child. And uh, in the sense that he he was able to create beautiful art through that childlike personality who never grew up. In that sense, he was, uh, in that sense, uh, his personality of never growing up uh, did a great thing positive. It had a positive effect. But in the sense that he never grew up uh, in the world of adults, I mean, as an adult, he was, he had a dubious character. He, uh, he was eccentric and uh, eccentric and uh, many adults uh, criticized him, blamed him. And he he also uh, he also did some things which was which were um, which were um, which were suspected to be uh, to be criminal. But I, we nobody is sure whether he really committed those crimes or not. Uh, so. Uh, I'm not going to say anything against him, of course not, because I have no evidence strong enough to prove that uh, he did uh, commit any such crime. Uh, but any in any way, in, uh, in any case, whether he did commit any such crimes or not, it doesn't matter to me. Even if he was a criminal, even if he was he really was a criminal. What then? It doesn't matter to me. The fact that he created beautiful, perfect m music and dance and everything, this fact remains. Whether he was a saint or not, doesn't matter. To me, his art remains remains intact. So, I don't care. I don't care where, uh, what I mean. So, but anyway, I'd like to know what we, he really did, what he was really thinking, what, how he was really feeling all his life. Just like I am interested to know what Karen Carpenter did actually did or said or thought and felt. All these, all these celebrities are really uh, aroused my curiosity a great deal uh, in that because I think I find, I find some similarities between those people and me, myself. Uh, I'm afraid I don't find any similarities between myself and these common people. Even though I am one of the common people, I don't find any solace, any soulmate, any friend among the common people, I'm afraid. But among the celebrities, even though I am far from a celebrity, even though I am far from talented, 
I think I find something in common with myself and some of their celebrities or some of their those famous people uh, who lived in uh, who lived a hundred years ago uh, several hundred years ago I find something in common between me and uh, Samuel Beckett the Nobel Prize winner um, novelist and uh, playwright too and uh, other other famous writers and uh, academics and artists Van Gogh too Vincent Van Gogh I find yes he he's repeat he's uh, infamous he's uh, he's very famous he he's highly he, Vincent Van Gogh, of course, he's very, uh, he's re really a, a great, uh, he was really a great guy in that he, he uh, created, created beautiful paintings and also he's uh, infamous for having cut off his ears and uh, Fighting, uh, fighting an ugly fight with uh, Gauguin. Gauguin, uh, Gauguin, who uh, went to Tahiti. He, uh, that famous artist who went to Tahiti and uh, uh, drew and uh, depicted all those uh, local women. And uh, Vincent Van Gogh. Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, I find. Vincent Van Gogh, he got, he had cut off his, both of his ears, and he so in that sense he was a self mutilator. Why did he do that? I mean, uh, the the direct reason why he did it was was uh, to to say to 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 uh, convey some statement to Gauguin, his close friend closest friend, but also maybe uh, Vincent Van Gogh. I'm not quite sure, but I'm not quite sure why exactly, what really drove her, drove him to cut off his ears. I'm not sure, but that act, that precise act uh, of Vincent Van Gogh reminds me of something that I did when I was younger. Uh, I was once a self-mutilator. I did I did something like that only once in my life. But I did something something similar to what Vogelgen did when he cut off his uh, ears. And I think I understand him. At least some of him, anyway. But no such person can I find anywhere in among the common people. Uh, when I talk with any member of the majority people, they always reject me. They always blame me. They freak out and. Uh, they can't just they just can't put up with listening to even the first minute of whatever I have to say to them. They just can't put up with them. I mean I'm I never try to blame them or fight with them or uh, denounce them or anything. I never say anything against them. I always say in I always say things in favor of them. I accept them. I accept. I try to accept them totally. But still, not even the first minute of whatever I have to say about myself, or how I, how I feel about myself, about my life, 
they can't, they just can't put up with it. And they freak out and they begin to attack me, verbalize, v verbally abuse me. So nobody, absolutely nobody among the common people understands me, has ever understood me. But Vincent van Gogh may have, might have understood me when, when I was around with him. Uh, Karen Carpenter might have understood some of me if I had been around in her presence, in, in, uh, in her, uh, uh, near her, as one of our friends. Uh, Michael Jackson might have understood some of me. He might have listened to several hours of my talk. And that's why I am obsessed, obsessed with these people eccentric people who may have done something terrible either to themselves or to somebody else especially to themselves anyway that's why I I'm obsessed I've always been obsessed with some famous famous people famous people uh, from several decades ago or from several hundred years ago and uh, that's part of the reason why I am uh, I can't ever find any solace with with uh, with uh, the ordinary world Okay, I have to stop here. I have to eat now. And after, after my, after, after breakfast, I may resume my talk. Thank you very much.